something interesting happened to me at work recently, and you said you came into a similar issue. I brought up the word black exploitation. I don't remember the context of where it came up, but it just felt natural to just, you know, it was just part of my lexicon of words and things I know, and it just seemed natural, just as, just as, it just came up naturally. To my shock, not a single person I asked at work knew what the word black exploitation was, and none of their guesses was at all related to film. They thought it was maybe like Black Lives Matter or something, but no one really knew the context of it. And it made me realize a few things. One, I'm old and I'm the old head now. I'm the oldest guy in the office. And the other thing is that I have a certain knowledge of film that I'm taking for granted that everyone knows that I really want to share. And I think you can't, you said you came up with a similar issue, but with noir instead of black exploitation, right? Yes, that's right. Um, I had written a play, which I was touring to fringe festivals. And, uh, you know, it was hard to explain to people what the play was. It was hard to convince them to come in and see it. And I would often say, well, it's really like an old film noir. And people would just look at me and, not know what I was talking about. And I would say, you know, film noir. And and one guy said, you mean black movies? <laughs> it's like a direct translation, I guess. <laughs> but uh, At least he I, knew what it, the word meant, even if yeah. you know what the movement was. Yeah, I was shocked. I mean, I just thought this is something you hear about all the time. People talk about film noir and examples of film noir, but I found a lot of people had no idea what that was. It's a close second to horror for my favorite genre, only because horror, there are more movies than horror. Like film noir is like a specific type of crime movie or a specific type of thriller. And the genuine film noirs are all done. You just have like neo noirs and there aren't that many neo noirs as opposed to horror movies where every day there's dozens of horror movies coming out. Um, more depending on how lower you go with as far as budget wise. Um, and also there are so many sub genres within the horror genre, even though they all come from the branch of thriller. Um, but noir is right up there with some of my favorite movies of all time. And I definitely, with this podcast, as we move forward, want to dive more into both of those genres, black exploitation and, and film noir. But for this one, I want to get more so into how and when you were introduced to these genres. Well, I think uh, in terms of film noir, I think uh, it was probably my dad who kind of told me to watch these movies that would come on TV. And uh, especially when we got a first, uh, our first VCR and we were able to tape movies because a lot of the channels would play interesting movies at midnight but it was too late to stay up and watch them. So my dad would say, oh, you got to tape this movie. And I saw movies like Casablanca and the Maltese Falcon, uh, a lot of Humphrey Bogart movies, uh, just because my dad really wanted to see them and he thought that I should see them. And uh, of course I, I loved them, you know, I thought they were great. So uh, I think that's probably how I was first introduced to film noir, although I'm not sure I knew the term at that point, I was pretty young. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I got introduced to it through a friend of mine who had like a bunch of, now I have hard drives with tons of movies, but this was way back when we're having a hard drive with a ton of movies on it was a novel idea. This was when you were like, I think, I don't think Blockbuster was around, but it was around the time when Blockbuster was recently shut down and then Netflix was starting to pop up, but the most popular form of Netflix was having DVDs email to your house, not email to your house. <laughs> email to your house. Yeah, they, they email DVDs to your house back then. Um, really back cool. in my day, no, when they would mail DVDs to your house, and um, that's like a Freudian slip, right? Showing like yeah. trying to not show my age, but showing my age. But they would actually mail DVDs to your house, and then you can keep it as long as you want, but you just have to return it to get another one or something like that. Um, so it was around that time frame. And um, so DVDs were like popularizing, um, Netflix was popularizing. So the idea of having like hundreds of movies on a hard drive was still kind of new. 
now I have like five hard drives in my house and one of them is dedicated just to movies um, with like a few terabytes worth. So this was probably just like maybe a couple of gigs of like old movies he had. And some of them were like film noir. I forgot why I wanted to specifically watch film noir, but I do remember two movies that stood out to me. Um, one was a um, Orson Welles film. And I think it was, I, I know it was an Orson Welles film. I'm trying to figure out which one specifically it was. I think it might have been, um, what's the one with the long shot where Charlton Heston plays a Mexican? Um, what is it called? Come uh, on, we can't be film experts if we can't get to the <laughs> basics, man. Yeah. I, we got to shut down the podcast if we can't get this one. <laughs> Come on, Touch no Googling. Evil. Touch of Evil, there we go. Touch, Touch of Evil. evil. So uh, I remember it was Touch of Evil, and it was a Fritz Slang movie, um, Rancho Notorious. Rancho Notorious is kind of a weird um, film noir because some places it's categorized as a Western, and other places it has the sensibilities of a noir, and also Fritz Lang did a lot of noirs, so some places it's categorized as noir. But for this conversation, we'll call it a noir. So it was uh, Rancho Notorious and A Touch of Evil. And I remember thinking like, man, this Orson Welles guy, his movies have so much talking in them. It's so boring. Who the fuck is this like fat, bloated idiot? And, you know, a few years later, he'd go on to be set, my second favorite filmmaker, only short of Stanley Kubrick, and probably the most influential filmmaker as far as like how I look and understand films and my approach to filmmaking. But uh, I didn't like um, any of the Orson Welles film. That was the first one he had showed me. And I kind of like Rancho Notorious. I thought it was a little bit silly with the song. And years later, I'd go on to read that um, Fritz Lang didn't like the song either. But Westerns at the time had songs that went with the theme and stuff like that. So that was a whole thing back then. But I really like Rancho Notorious. And I like the themes of noir, even though, like I said, Rancho Notorious can be considered um, a Western. But I like the themes of it, of revenge and you know, uh, femme fatales and all this sort of stuff. And it really kind of hooked me, even though it didn't really hook me. It was kind of like the long game. And that's kind of what got me introduced to it. And like I said, uh, eventually I, I loved Orson Welles movies. I came to embrace the dialogue because there was so much density to it as far as like what's going on and the information he's trying to like pass through. But um, but yeah, those are those were probably the two movies, and that was the experience that got me into it. And then eventually, like I start, I was working in a hotel where the owner um, uh, grew up in a movie theater, and the whole the whole hotel was themed with uh, vintage movies, and there were original print posters from movies from the 30s to the 50s. And I just started watching all the movies of that era, and I just went through like a tons of noir, and I just I loved it all. So what do you think of those particular movies? I mean, are you fans of those or in general or? Cause I know like obviously the, the, the um, Orson Welles um, Touch of Evil is a classic, but Rancho Notorious is kind of, by some people considered schlock, but I, I still kind of like it. Yeah, I'm not sure if I've actually seen Rancho Notorious, to be honest, I'm not sure. You haven't? I'm not sure, yeah, I, I, it's possible I've never seen that one. That's crazy, it's, it's, it's yeah. a lot of fun. I think you'd love it. Because right. it's you like schlock and you like noir, I'm assuming. I do, yeah. <laughs> it's, it's schlocky noir. Okay, well. <laughs> if you love westerns, then you're going to really love this, but it's yeah. schlocky noir. Well, I do love westerns, and there are a few westerns that are kind of like noir westerns. Um, Jubal, I think, is another one. Um, but, uh, yeah, Touch of Evil, I, I do like it, but I remember uh, the first time I saw it, it was after it had been restored, so I did not see the original cut that was released. I just saw the one where they tried to restore it to Orson Welles' vision for the movie, and uh, I was older at that point, and I, I actually wasn't so sure, you know, because I'd heard so much about it and how brilliant it was, and then I watched this and I thought, hmm, I don't know. I mean, maybe, uh, maybe there's a reason why they butchered it, you know, like I. I just wasn't sure, but I watched it again a few years later, and I realized that no, this is this is a very good movie. Where where do you stand with Orson Welles in general? Like, what's who like who's your favorite filmmaker? And where 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 is Orson Welles relative to your favorite filmmakers? 
Uh, well, that's a good question. I, I don't know that I would put Orson Welles in my top 10, but I, I do think he's a good filmmaker. And Citizen Kane is actually one of the films. That Orson Welles is not a top 10 filmmaker? <laughs> well, probably we have to stop not. this podcast and that right now. Name 10 <laughs> filmmakers better than Orson Welles. Well, it's not a question of better. It's yeah, I know, I know, I know, I know, I know. Favorite, you know, yeah. because I love horror and I love David Cronenberg and George Romero and John Carpenter, all those great horror directors. So uh, I don't know that Orson Welles would quite make it into the top ten, but I do, I do think he's a very good filmmaker. And, and it Citizen pains Kane. Me. It pains me to hear you not have Orson Welles in your top ten. It really does. <laughs> I don't know if we can get past the first podcast if Orson Welles oh, is not your top ten. Uh, well, you know, maybe I need to reevaluate. Maybe I need to look at some of his films again. Um, I probably haven't even seen all of his films, to be honest. But um, you haven't seen all of his films? He had, he didn't make that many as a director. I mean, he true. starred in a lot because he you know he needed funding and then he just needed to support his lifestyle and, and things like that. So he just starred in movies just for money, but. As far as a director, he only made a few, so. That, that's true, that's true. Uh, but Citizen Kane, as I said, that was one of the ones that my dad insisted that I tape at midnight and, and we watched it and I really liked it. I was impressed by that one, for sure. This is Rancho Notorious. Are you at least, so we already established that you have bad taste in film, that's why you're not a <laughs> Orson Welles fan. <laughs> Are you at least a Fritz Lang fan? Uh, well, yes. I mean, uh, again, I don't think I've seen all of his films, but uh, the ones I've seen, I have liked very much. Oh, my God. What are we going to do with you, my friend? <laughs> what are we going to do with you? So well, let's we... just take a, a quick trip to All Movie. All Movie is my favorite site because those reviewers are more in line with my tastes than okay. any other review sites I go to. So okay. usually if they like something, I like it. So um, it's a shortcut for me because like most of the movies they give five stars to, I give five stars, most they give four stars to. I, it, we don't perfectly line up, but like if I'm not sure if I want to watch a movie, I'll go there. And if, if, if I agree with them, then I'll watch it. So okay. for me, a great filmmaker has at least five five star movies on allmovie.com and that theory seems to pan out so let's just skip through some of Fritz Lang's filmography because unlike Orson Welles who we brought up before he's made a lot of movies because you know he was in Germany and whatever and and you know he did movies in the U.S. and all that stuff one of the pioneers of Meisen scene and film noir and all that good stuff silent movies to talkies to film noirs so let's just go through well we'll go through four stars and higher um based okay. on, on on their references uh destiny you're talking about we're talking about silent films at this point um dr mabuse the gambler he did a whole dr mabuse series are you familiar with that at all i think so yes yeah i think he was one of the people that were pioneers of intercutting two storylines to build up tension uh, i think in in the mabuse series he'd have like two intersecting stories that were all going to a climax and he would cut in between like this person and they did try to do this and the other person trying to do that so he was one of the pioneers in doing stuff like that i mean when you're move, making movies in the 20s you're going to be a pioneer of anything but <laughs> um, he was one of the pioneers of doing stuff like that so I'm, i i do like the mabuse series Metropolis. Have you seen that one? Yes, of course. Yeah, that's brilliant. That, yeah, that's one of the classics, and it has a huge influence on like how we see the future in movies. Like obviously, like Tim Burton, the Batman movies, a lot of Tim Burton movies. You got um, Blade Runner. A lot of movies like that take influence on Metropolis and his version of the future. And I mean, for that movie alone, he would have been canceled in today's culture because <laughs> I think there was a woman inside the robot suit and he was notorious for being hard on actors and not giving a bleep about them. And I think there were stories about him having her in that suit for like hours on end until she fainted in the suit for no reason. Just like really, really cruel to her and just to actors in general. He was like, I don't know if it's cruel, but 
not not em empathetic to their feelings just viewing them as like objects to get his art done so uh, i don't know if it was intentional or i don't know if it was malice or he's just like a sociopath or something but um but yeah that was that was a great film that's his first five star film oh, so okay. we can agree that we can both agree that's great we both saw it right yes absolutely okay. yeah that is one he's got four more to go yes and then you have to acknowledge he's a great director maybe not your top 10 favorite but a top 10 director <laughs> okay. yes could be could be have you seen m yes absolutely Classic. another mas masterpiece yes yes Br that's... brilliant movie yeah yeah um that's not really a film noir but it gets kind of lumped in there but uh it's not really a noir in my opinion yeah but, uh, well that's cool. that that's where you get into the thing where you know people they're looking at movies that were made 10 years before film noir really became a thing right and they're saying well this kind of has the elements you know or you know i mean in the in the 30s they made a lot of gangster films right but they wouldn't have been film noir per se they're just crime movies gangster movies right yeah yeah well i mean people like categorizing because it 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 can bring a movie into a category where it's like it can be more appreciated than outside of that category. Because if you yeah. bring M into film noirs, it's one of the great film noirs ever made. If you For leave sure. M on its own, how do you really acknowledge it? Like, how do you highlight it? You know, how do you get yeah. people to watch it? How do you get a yeah. community together to say, let's watch M or let's appreciate M if it's not categorized, if it's not part of something, you know? And otherwise, yeah. like, how do you categorize it otherwise, you know? So yeah. I can see why people do stuff like that. Yeah, I think it's also that, you know, as you were saying, there's a limited number of the classic film noir. And, uh, you know, if we can expand that and start to include earlier movies and later movies, then we have a lot more film noir to appreciate, if you know yeah. what I mean. Absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. Uh, we also have The Testament of Dr. Mabuse. That's another Dr. Mabuse film. I think he did three or four Dr. Mabuse films. Um, yeah, but yeah, that's I'm another sure. one. That's yeah, a four-star. I'm, sure I'm sure I've seen at least one of them, but I couldn't tell you offhand which one I saw. I'll give you some leeway with that, because silent yeah. films are tricky for people to get into, so I'll, I'll cut you some slack. <laughs> now, this one is not considered a classic, but I loved it. And I did some research on this film. I couldn't find anything definitive that said this was about race, but he couldn't cast a black actor in the lead um, because it's a studio film. At this point, he's in the US in the mid thirties. Um, Cause he couldn't cast, one, he couldn't cast a black person in the lead for a major studio film. And two, even if he could, to get films done, you need stars. And this had a star in um, Spencer Tracy in the lead. But the, from what I remember of the film, Spencer Tracy is dating this woman and they're going to get married. He goes into the town where she lives in and they, they automatically all hate him. And they, they accuse him of something he didn't do. And I think they're about to burn down the jail he's in. They think he's dead, but he's not. And he goes out. He wants revenge against them, so he makes them go on trial and he wants them to get hanged for his killing or go to jail for his killing even though he's alive. So it's kind of like, I love the way that plays out, but the hate for Spencer Tracy didn't really make a lot of sense. It would make a lot more sense if Spencer Tracy was a black guy dating a white woman in the 30s, going to her hometown, all of that would make the film would make a million times more sense, and I think it would be acknowledged with just a casting change, the exact same movie. I think today people look at it as a classic. So in my mind, I view it that he couldn't, and for me, it's a classic. I think it's just a pretty good film if you watch it now, but to me in that context, that I'm all making up in my head because I have no facts to back this up. But to me, I love that film. Have you seen it or no? Yes, I have, and I thought it was really good. I liked it. I liked it a lot. And uh, what you're saying makes sense. I could believe that, actually. But I, I do think it is a, a sort of a lost classic, maybe. It should be a classic, but it's maybe not as many people know it. But yeah, I think it's, it's really... Yeah, it's not very popular. Yeah, it's really good, though. Definitely. Yeah. 
Yeah, and, and a young James, Ca a, a young uh, Spencer Tracy, uh, Freudian slip there because watching it, he, he's acting like more of like a James Cagney than a Spencer Tracy that we know and love today for those yeah. who love old films. Yeah. Yeah, he, he sure. never seen him play the tough guy much, and he definitely played it in that film. Yes. Definitely. Um, definitely. Yeah. Okay, from there, Manhunt, that's a smaller film. Let me click on this to see if they categorize it in noir. I vaguely remember it because it's been a while since I've seen it. I know it had to do with Nazis. No, it's, it's a more of a Nazi thriller, political type uh -huh. thing. Um, that's not a very popular one. I won't hold that against you if you never saw it or heard of it. <laughs> I think I have a VHS copy of Moontide, actually. Okay. I've also never heard of that not. one. Okay. I think it is noir, or noir-ish anyway. Mm -hmm. um, I, li I liked it, as I recall. I haven't seen it in many years. Mm -hmm. But um, it's, it's certainly close. not a really well they call, known. It, they call it a yeah. crime drama, which is close. Yeah. Ida Lupino, yeah. she's she's a real popular actress. So I mean, I've never seen it though. Oh yeah, you got me beat there. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Hangman also die. That's a title I've heard a lot, but I've never seen that one. Uh, I've actually seen that. I I have a DVD set of unusual film noir. I think it's called, mm -hmm. and um, that's one of them. And I thought it was good. They're labeling this more of a war film. Would you consider it new war since you've seen it? Yeah. Yeah, I would. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, the Woman in the Window. I've seen this movie so many times. No, no, I'm thinking of I'm thinking of Scarlet Street because The Woman in the Window and Scarlet Street had the uh, same oh, cast. Oh, yeah, yeah it, because I okay. think one was so popular that they made another one with the same principal actors. It was Scarlet Street I've seen a million times because it's um, public domain. Right. I've probably seen The Women in the Window once or twice, but I don't remember it too specifically. Um, but I know I've seen Scarlet Street a bunch. Have you seen either or both? I suspect I've probably seen both. I don't really remember Woman in the Window too well. I definitely have seen Scarlet Street mm -hmm. have a copy of it. Yeah. Um, Thought it was re really good once again, mm -hmm. but yeah, it's been a long time since I've watched either of those. So, if in fact I've seen Woman in the Window, yeah. Uh, Edward G. Robinson, um, Danny Duray or Duray, I always forget how to pronounce his, his name, and yeah. uh, Joanne Bennett. Um, those are the three principal actors in, in both of those films. But uh, uh, okay. yeah, yeah, yeah. Ministry yeah. of Fear. I think this is noir. I don't think I've seen it though. Yeah, I think I might have seen it. Mm -hmm. I think it's another sort of World War II kind of setting, maybe. Yeah, yeah. I mean, he did yeah. a lot of war movies because of where he yeah. was from, and also because of the time, you know. So it was yeah. a lot of like, once he came to the U.S., it was a lot of like war movies and a lot of film noirs, which you know are, are directly correlate to the war as well. Cloak and Dagger yeah. sounds like a noir. I've never seen that one. No, I haven't Secret either. Beyond the Door sounds like a noir. And then we have House uh, by the River. Is this getting into Westerns when he started? or uh, Maybe. A period film. I don't know if I've seen this one. It doesn't star uh, anyone. I... No, no. Yeah, um, I, don't, I, don't, I don't know. I don't think so. Mm -hmm. And there we have... Rancho Notorious. This is the one that started this whole conversation. Rancho yes. Notorious. Um, so this starred Marlena Dietrich, um, oh, one, one yes. of my favorite actresses of that era. Yes. So I know she she was she played. The, I mean, she was very beautiful when she was young, and I think she was she fell into that trap where a lot of actresses do in general, but especially in that time where they hit a certain age and they don't want to play the mother. And if you don't want to play the mother at a certain age and unfairly to women, it's a, quite a young age where you can only play the mother when you're no longer in your twenties or early thirties. And, um, where she starts getting older and she doesn't, she wants to keep playing a character that's in her twenties, you know, and 
this film kind of acknowledges the age gap with her and the lead actor. Um, but sometimes they overplay the age gap. Because I remember there was this movie um, I'd seen, Seven Men From Now. And in it, it had this the lead actor was like, I don't know, like 15, 20 years older than the actress. But they didn't want to cast the actress because they felt she was too old. So that's the thing in Hollywood too. Sometimes like, even if, if you're above 30, even if you're a lot younger than your male co-star, they still want to acknowledge the fact that you're a little bit up there in age, you know? Mm -hmm. um, so yeah. they did this with this movie in that they acknowledged the fact that she was older. So I'm just curious to find out how much older she was than her, her male co-star, because they did bring that up a lot. So she was born in 1901. And Rancho Notorious came out in 1952. So she was 51. So she was up there. And yeah. now the lead actor in this was Arthur Kennedy. And he was born in 1914. So okay. he was 13 years younger than her. So that is pretty significant. Yeah. But they, they, they did highlight it, though. Yeah. So I, I love her pre-code movies. I remember... Uh, the first time seeing Blonde Venus, uh, it was actually in a, a film class that I was taking. And uh, there's actually nudity in there, you know, from 1932 or whatever year it is. And that kind of blew my mind, you know, because you don't pre think of movies. Yeah, pre-code. You don't think of movies that old having nudity in them or having really open sexual material. But uh, her early movies definitely have that. And uh, I also love Destry Rides Again, her mm -hmm. Western that was mm -hmm. made several years later. Uh, but that one kind of feels like a pre-code movie in a way. Mm -hmm. they're, they're doing so many things in there. And I think maybe they got away with it somehow because it's kind of a comedy. They're kind of poking fun at it in a way. I'm mm -hmm. not sure, but I, I think it's a great movie too. Mm -hmm. And yes, I just, you know, I'll watch anything with Marlena Dietrich in it for sure. The Blue Angel was one of my favorite movies that, it wasn't my favorite movie that she did necessarily, but it was my favorite performance of hers in a movie. Um, I've seen that movie several times. Oh yeah. Yeah. Well, and it has that very definitely. popular song um, uh, that she sings in it. God, I forgot how the song goes. Is it Falling in Love Again or? Yes, Falling in Love Again. Yeah. Yeah. She was kind of pudgy in this, a young Marlena. She was a little pudgy. Oh yeah. Yeah. But, um, uh, definitely one of her most iconic roles. Yeah, yeah that's a that's a really good song though. Falling in love again. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, okay, let's finish up on Lang. So, Clash by Night. Sure. This sounds like another noir. Um, the Blue Gardenia. I think this is one I've seen, based on the title. Um, yeah, I think I've seen this one, um, but it doesn't really stand out to me. It, I definitely, it's a, definitely a noir, but it doesn't really stand out to me as huge. His next big hit commercially and also um, critically was The Big Heat. Have you seen that one? Yes, I, I think that one's great. I, uh, I've seen it more than once. Mm -hmm. I actually have an old uh, I have an old copy on Beta, if you can believe it. Mm -hmm. I found an old Betamax tape of that movie. And uh, I have an old Betamax machine because that's what we had back in the early days. Um, so I actually watched the beta tape of that movie, uh, but I think I also have a DVD. It's, uh, yeah, that one's great. Mm -hmm. So we have three great movies now. We have two more before you acknowledge him as an <laughs> all-time great filmmaker. <laughs> but he's running out of time because he fell off the cliff a really like early, not early on. He's made, so look how many movies we've gone through. But uh, he, he did fall off the cliff after a while and stopped making great movies. Oh, yeah. Uh, Human Desire. We're just going to skim through some of these. A, a lot of these are film noirs. He didn't branch out to other things. Let me know if you notice anything. 1,000 Eyes of Dr. Mabuse. He made another Dr. Mabuse movie in 1960. <laughs> Jeez. That's when you know things are starting to go bad is when you go back to the, go back to the well. He's going back yeah. to the well. Like, uh, what was that, like 40 years later or something almost? Yeah. Uh, yeah, almost. yeah, I think at this point he's done. Then we're getting into the 80s and he hasn't made anything. So it's three 
undisputed all-time classics with several really, really good films. So yeah. I'll let you off the hook in the sense that you <laughs> don't have to call him one of the great filmmakers of all time. But without a doubt, there's absolute consensus. We have Metropolis, The Big Heat, and M. And then we have several debatable movies. But for me, all movie is a good guideline for my taste, and I think overall taste, um, because there's so many places you could go for film opinions. So if they have five five-star movies for a filmmaker, to me, that's a great filmmaker. He has three, so we'll call him, he's all time, but he's not Mount Rushmore, and he's not best of the best, but he's up there. Can we agree on that? Yes, absolutely. And uh, I think I think I do need to explore more some of these films that I haven't seen, because uh, yeah, there's a lot here that I did really like. So I think he definitely is one of the great filmmakers whether he's top 10 or not, I don't know, but he's definitely a great filmmaker. Based on our test, he hasn't cut the mustard, unfortunately. Yeah. <laughs> so do you want to dive a little bit into Orson Welles or then we'd have to do black exploitation another time or do you just want to go to black exploitation now? Uh, well, we can do Orson Welles. Um, okay. Yeah. Orson Welles. This again, for me, He's number two, only to uh, Kubrick. Okay. Let's take a look at the film. Let's see what IMDb says. Okay. Uh, IMDb, I mean all movie. Let's see what all movie says. So he's gonna have a big filmography because he did a lot of acting, but we're just focusing on the stuff that we 100% know he directed. Um, right. Some of the stuff he shadow directs and stuff, but um, we're gonna start off with the classic his first full-length feature film, Citizen Kane. Do we even need to discuss this, one of the all-time classic films? No, I don't think so. I think uh, everybody knows that that is one of the greatest movies ever made. I think it does it's... suffer from younger filmmakers or, or, or film viewers who watch it or film buffs who watch it or whoever watches it now. Because one, it, the same thing that happened to me the first time I saw it, a lot of fucking talking. Oh, yeah. Two, not a lot of action, but you have to remember a lot of the things, if if you guys haven't seen it, you do plan on watching it, or if you saw it and you didn't like it, a lot of the things you're watching on screen with this movie, the very first time it happened. So it's like, you can say, oh, we well, the we'll scene is whatever. First time, a lot of the techniques he used, his filmmaking techniques, first time. So while you can say, well, this isn't special, that isn't special, it's because this is a manual on how to make movies. And you're watching a master and people watch this, learn from it, emulate it decades, decades later. And that's why you may watch it now and not have that feeling that you should have or you could have if you saw it when it came out. Um, one thing that's interesting I will mention we won't divert into another filmmaker now, but we can also, we can maybe do this filmmaker test once a podcast, actually. But another <laughs> filmmaker we can test out is, um, who's that filmmaker that did all the Westerns with John Wayne? John Ford? John Ford, yeah. He said, uh, Orson Welles, he said he learned everything he learned from filmmaking by watching Stagecoach, which is a great John Ford film. I think it's the first one he did with um, John Wayne. Great, 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 yeah. great, great, great movie. So yeah. even the masters learn from masters. So, yeah. Um, but yeah, that's so we a, have. That's the story I heard too, is that, you know, Orson Welles had done a lot of theater. He, he was a brilliant theater director, but he got a chance to make a movie and he didn't really know, well, how do you do that? How do you make a movie? So he went to the studio screening room and had them run stagecoach over and over again. He watched it like a hundred times times or something and that was basically his film school so that's pretty cool i think yeah absolutely um yeah yeah nothing more to say the magnificent embersons <laughs> so i didn't think i was gonna like this because it was so butchered it's a short version they didn't let him finish it so i've read a lot about orson welles and 
I forget the filmmaker. He befriended this filmmaker, Peter Bondanovich, I think it was, who wrote a lot about him. And he took a lot of Orson Welles stories to his grave. And he said he would because he's very protective of Orson Welles because they were great friends later in life. Mm -hmm. um, but he, Bondanovich said, there are a lot of great books, a lot of great stories about Orson Welles. Half of it's true. Half of it's fantasy. Half of it's made up by Orson Welles. Half of it's made up by people who love Orson Welles. It was this, um, there were these uh, at the hotel I work at. Um, there's uh, Florentine Films. Uh, the documentary filmmaker, um, Ken Burns. It's his production company. They would do a lot of color correcting in um, the meatpacking district, which is close to the hotel I worked at. So they'd come there all the time, whatever. Um, uh, there was this great quote. Um, they did the documentary on J Jack Johnson, the boxer. I think it's Jack Johnson is his name. Is that his name? Yeah, that, yeah, that Jack is a name. Yeah, yeah. Jack sure. Johnson. They did this great documentary on Jack Johnson, the boxer. And um, there was a story on he got a speeding ticket from the officer and he said, how much is the ticket? Let's say whatever the amount was, $50. He says, here's a hundred. You're going to, so I'm speeding on the way back too. essentially the, <laughs> some of the story like that. And, and they asked Ken Burns, is the story true? He's like, I don't know, but it's a great story. You've heard it like attributed to a lot of different people but it's so good you can't leave it out you know i think that's kind of how it is with orson welles there's so many great stories it's like is this folklore because it did but you just fuck it it sounds good let's just associate it with orson welles there's a lot of great stories about orson welles um but evidently like a lot of why he didn't have the filmography of one of the all-time greats like if you think of him an all-time great you have to think of his potential you can't look at just his films because he didn't direct as many as directors in his era directed um a lot of it was self-destructive though a lot of it was people loving him idolizing him wanting to give him money and he just insults them in meetings berates them tests their intelligence if he doesn't respect them he walks out he was incredibly self-destructive and you can see that in, in, in his weight gain, like physically self-destructive and also career-wise self-destructive. And that was something Bogdanovich said. And that kind of started with Citizen Kane. He wanted to piss people off. And when we talk about stories about like producers trying to intervene in filmmakers doing their movies, and when the producer comes on set, they just stop shooting. Well, that's an Orson Welles folklore that's actually true, where the producers would come in and he didn't want them to interfere. So what he would do is they'd come in, he'd grab a, a baseball and he'd start throwing it and playing catch. And until they left, that's all he would do. And when they leave, he'd continue making, making the movie because he didn't want them to interfere. But things like that, um, having facial hair, they didn't like that because it wasn't like a, a good look. And he would, so he would grow a beard and, he would just do things just to piss them off because he hated the studio system so much. And he started to pay the consequences for that right after he made the movie because I don't think he won any awards for Citizen Kane. Um, and then also his movie started to get severely chopped up right after that. And the Magnificent Embersons got severely chopped up. I didn't think I would like it. I wanted to watch it as a film historian, as a fan of his. But despite all the butchering they did to that movie, I still loved it. Oh. Well, this is where I have to admit that I have not seen The Magnificent Ambersons. I've heard about it. I've heard the stories of the butchering. And maybe for that reason, I just never watched it. I just wasn't sure, you know. So that's one that I can't really say whether I like it or not, because I've never seen it. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, I'm going to speak for you, and that's two. <laughs> okay. <laughs> that's two five stars. Even though, all yeah, all movie did give it five stars. The fans gave it four and a half. Okay. Journey into uh, Fear. So this was a movie he technically didn't direct, but he gave the person who directed it all of his directing notes. I think he was doing Jane Eyre or something at the time. 
Um, he was just acting to get money to fund his next project, but he gave all of his notes, all of his, um, uh, all of his um, shot composition, everything to the person who directed it. And I think he starred in it as well. He had an acting role in the movie as well. Um, but it's debatable whether he directed it. I'd like to say he didn't direct it because I didn't like it that much. I thought it was okay. And it pains me to think one of my favorite directors of all time directed an okay movie. But I didn't love it. <laughs> Technically, he didn't direct it. Some people say Shadow directed it. Um, other people say it was just his notes and someone else directed it. Are you familiar with this one at all? Uh, I've definitely heard of it. I may have seen it many years ago, but I don't really remember it. So no, I don't really, I don't know much about it. Mm -hmm. And this was the time where he was doing a lot of acting. Like I said, the Jane Eyre thing, and you'll see more acting credits come up. Um, one thing he would do in some of his uh, movies, and I have nothing to back this up in any of the things I've read, but there are some of the movies he did, um, starting with Tomorrow is Forever, where he has an Orson, Lo Orson Welles monologue that I personally think um, he wrote. Um, okay, we're, we're going to have to wrap up in the next 10 minutes. Well, I personally think he wrote Tomorrow's Forever is a very average movie, but towards the end of it, and, and one thing he did in the movies he starred in, he gave you his name value, but he was only on screen for so much time. He played very small roles, so he can go back to shooting his own stuff. Um, and Tomorrow's Forever, he has this monologue that turns this average movie into something incredibly memorable. Just his acting and his voice and his presence, this monologue at the end of this boring, okay, forgettable movie just made me rewatch it several times because it, it brought it into a different context. Um, very forgettable movie, incredible performance, I would just watch it for the monologue um, and then just watch the whole movie to put the monologue into context, but otherwise pretty forgettable. Are you familiar with that one at all? No, I'm not, no. Mm -hmm. It sounds interesting though. Yeah. The Stranger is a popular one because it's public domain. I'm sure probably that's, aside from Citizen Kane, one of the movies that people have seen the most from Orson Welles. Again, just like A Journey Into Fear, I don't love it. Um, I think it's not that good. So I was very happy when I read, he said, I could make movies like this several a year if I wanted to, but it's a studio movie and it's not the type of movie I want to make. I was so happy and relieved when I heard that because <laughs> I thought, I thought it was okay. It was pretty forgettable. If it wasn't for Orson Welles and if it wasn't public domain, I probably wouldn't have watched it. Yeah, I think I've seen that one, and I thought it was pretty good, but I don't remember it very well. So it doesn't stand out as, you know, one of the great ones, for sure. Yeah. Um, and here we have another classic. All movie decides they're going to give it four and a half, but I'm going to give it a five. Um, but going by all movie rules, I guess it's technically not a five-star movie. Um, <laughs> but The Lady from Shanghai, have you seen this one? Yes, absolutely. That one's a classic, for sure. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, Quentin Bondanovich, he, he, again, this was another studio interfered movie where he gave, uh, just like, uh, Touch of Evil, he gave the studio like tons of, like a book full of notes on how he wanted it done. But Bondanovich said, like, he stopped protesting a while just because he was tired of the movie, wrote it, starred in it, directed it, spent so much time with it. And I can, I can empathize with this as well. At a certain point, you just want to move on from a project um, and he eventually just he just stopped protesting after a while and he didn't protest with this much as much as um, the notes would dictate like the amount of changes they made he didn't protest as much as you would think because he just kind of want to move on from it and he did the same thing here that he did with um, uh, Citizen Kane and that one of the major characters that were in the movie that he kind of made fun of was an actual powerful person behind the scenes. With Citizen Kane, it was the um, the newspaper guy that um, Kane was based on. And here, there was a studio director that was in love with his wife. I think they were still married at the time, 
or they were in the process of getting divorced. But the studio head at what what company was it that distributed this? Was it Warner Brothers or something? Uh, let me see who distributed it. But the studio head was in love with Rita Hayward, um, mm -hmm. and uh, Orson Welles made him out to be like this cripple who's in love with her, like Rita Hayward's main love interest who he's stealing her from was this guy who was crippled and working with these clutches and he made him seem like a little pathetic and controlling of this woman that doesn't want him, that wants to be with other people. So it was kind of like bringing behind the scenes in front of the camera, pissing off studio people, the usual Orson Welles stick that, again, sabotages his own progress and his own success. So um, are you familiar with this one at all? Oh yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, that's very good. I've seen it a couple of times. It's a very good movie. Yeah, it I looks like, like it. Columbia was in one, Columbia Pictures. But it was a yeah. studio head at the time that he's mocking when he did that, so. Okay. Um, yeah. I'm sorry, I'm, I have all this long, boring backstory of Orson Welles because I've read so much about him. I did say he was my second favorite filmmaker. To even things out, we're going to have you next time do the filmmaker and you can tell all the boring backstory you know about the filmmaker. And I'll sit back and listen because <laughs> I know okay. all this information Sounds that I just, want to, I just want to share it so much. Um, yeah, well, that's, that's great. Yeah. Macbeth. Um, I like this. This is, uh, this is, I mean, this is kind of getting into low budget independent filmmaking um, because these are the type of movies we're coming up to that he was funding by um, doing all these acting projects. But I love Macbeth. Mm hmm. Yeah, I'm not sure if I actually saw Macbeth. I definitely saw Othello when they re-released that one. Mm -hmm. um, I, I may have seen Macbeth, I'm not sure. But mm -hmm. um, I remember Othello. Okay. Yeah, I love them both um, uh, equally as well, but uh, Othello seems to be the one that gets the most praise. Um, and it is a five star. And yep. you know what that means? We're up to three now, right? Yes, that's We're true. We're getting there. Yes. We're getting there. Yeah. Um, and in between those two, a lot of acting work. Um, because again, Macbeth and Othello, those are independent movies that he just funded himself, doing a lot of acting. Again, he had the studio movie thanks to his wife at the time. But again, he sabotages himself um, with that. Mm -hmm. Even made her cut her, he made her cut her hair, which the studio guy that he's making fun of. I wish I knew the guy's name. Maybe I'll put it on the screen after, before I post this so you guys know who I'm talking about. But he, he yeah. didn't want Rita Hayward to cut her hair, so Orson Welles specifically made Rita Hayward cut her hair. Because <laughs> um, he thought oh, it was man. part of her image. Yeah. Um, the Third yeah. Man. Oh, the yes. Third Man was another one um, where he, just like Tomorrow is Forever, where he has that great monologue where he gets a lot of credit for writing, whether he did or he didn't, the whole cuckoo clock monologue. And again, a movie where he comes in at the end, they use his name and he gets his money and he doesn't have to spend a lot of time on set. Um, but they say he did contribute some uh, shots to the film, um, which is one of the great things with Austin Wells, his cinematography and the shots he chooses and things like that. Um, but a great yeah. monologue he has at the end of that movie as well. Yeah, um, and that is a great, great movie too. Absolutely, absolutely. I'm trying to see if I skipped anything significant here. Again, we're getting into a lot of the acting stuff at this point. Um, we're getting down to towards the end of his career. Mr. Arcaden, again, another independent film. I loved it. Doesn't get, really get as much love. It's kind of in there with Wells and Mc, with uh, Othello and Macbeth as well, but I loved it. Have you seen that? No, I haven't, no. Yeah. It's another public domain one. I, I like it a lot. Even though he okay. directs that, he just gives himself a small role where he kind of comes in at the end. Um, and uh, Moby Dick, another one, where he's just an actor who comes in at the end with a great monologue. Um, his monologues are just the best in film history. Um, I should say too, he's not one of my, just my favorite filmmakers. He's also one of my favorite actors all time as well. Makes sense. Uh, Touch of Evil. Another five star. Do we agree with this one? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. We're yeah. getting there. Even though at, at first I wasn't sure, but yeah, yeah. Now I would say it's definitely a great movie. You weren't sure, meaning you had to watch it a few times before you enjoyed it. 
Yeah, the very first time I saw it, I wasn't sure because I'd heard so much about it. I guess my expectations were so high and I was like, eh, I don't know, you know, mm -hmm. but um, watching it again, though, I can see the brilliance of it mm -hmm. for sure. Yeah, yeah. And I would say, uh, again, we're going through a lot of acting stuff and voice stuff. Um, I would say Compulsion, um, that's the last of the movies that he starred in that he played a bit role and came in at the end with a great monologue that I loved. And oh, this yeah. was based on the same thing that Rope was, that mm. um, uh, Hitchcock film. Yes. Um, but he comes in and has a great monologue towards the end of that film as well. Um, the Trial, I love, it's, uh, it's, it's a Kafka-esque movie. I love The Trial. It's another one of his independent films that I, I just think are, is just unbelievable. A Man for All Seasons, that's well regarded, a movie that he started, in, but I didn't really care for it. Um, Chimes at Midnight, that's again another, um, that's one of the movies that's considered great from him, that his that I didn't like at all. Mm. Um, have you seen that one? No, I haven't, no. Mm. It's one movie that, it's the only movie that's considered great from him that I didn't care for. It's just a little too Shakespearean, even though he did the other Shakespeare stuff. I kind of like that. That's yeah. one of the Shakespeare things I didn't care for much at all. So, okay. Yeah. And we're getting into a lot of acting stuff. I know there are two. F for fake. Yeah. And... We, I'm sorry. I promise you're going to talk more. It's just that we happen to get on oh. a subject that I love. Yeah. No, that's, if we that's... talk Kubrick and we talk Orson Welles, it's going to be hard for you to get some words. <laughs> That's all right. <laughs> I was going to say that I do have uh, the Criterion DVD of F is for Fake. That may be um, one of my favorite Wells movies, even though it's technically not a movie, but kind of a movie. It's got, it's, I think it's kind of like one of the yeah. early like mockumentaries, but what did you think of F for Fake? Yeah, well, I knew nothing about it. I'd never even heard of it, really, but uh, I wound up getting a huge stack of Criterion DVDs from this guy who was selling them. And so we, we just kind of bought all of them, not knowing what some of them were. And, and one was F is for fake. And I watched it and I really liked it. I thought it was great. And it was very interesting the way it was kind of, I mean, it's all about fake, right? Being fake and, you know, is this real? Is this not real? I, I thought it was kind of a brilliant documentary or mockumentary or whatever it was. I, I really liked it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and it gets a lot of his monologues in there, which to me is one of the best part about Orson Welles is when he's talking. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. I, I, I loved it. And that, I think that brings us to five. I think we're at five yeah. five star movies. <laughs> <laughs> but I think there's one more. To, I think we, there's a consensus we can add one more to it now. Because sure. if we keep going after Effort for Fake, or is it around? Did I pass it already? I may pass it because I'm into 93. Um... F is for fake. It was before F is for fake then. What the hell is... Where is it? What year did it come out? Chimes at Midnight. Where's the Touch of Evil? What year did that come out? Uh, was it in the 50s? I think maybe the 60s. Oh, here it is. 50, 58. Oh, 50, 58. 58. Okay. Yeah, they, now this is acknowledged as one of the last true film noirs where it doesn't get into neo-noir territory. Because I think when you get into the 60s, like black and white goes away, small movies go away, and TV's really taking off. And people, you know, don't want to watch, they want big and bombastic, kind of like now. Where it's just like, you know, in the 50s when TV was taking off and people wanted big things on the screen where you had the giant musicals and surround, uh, it, it was it surround sound but different sound elements were coming in and um you had the bigger screens and panavision and all that stuff to get people back into the theaters with big budget stuff kind of like now where it's like you need like a marvel movie to get people to come to theaters or like top gun and yeah. the smaller movies are going to streaming they had that same issue and then um you know those low budget film noirs that were made on back alleys for like no money and just basically like B movies at the time stuff like that were wasn't being made anymore it's not profitable so I think a touch of evil is 
credited as one of the, the last ones. Definitely the last great one if, if it's not officially the last one. Mm-hmm. For sure. Yeah. Okay. Um, so, I mean, that's six. So we can, we can widely acknowledge that Orson Welles is indeed a great filmmaker. Yes. Okay. I will. I, th- I will definitely admit that he is a great filmmaker, and I, <laughs> I, I have been uh, remiss in not watching some of these movies, like the Magnificent Ambersons. I really should watch that movie, and uh, and then who knows? Maybe he would be on my personal list. I don't know, but mm. uh, but yes, he's a great filmmaker for sure. Okay. So I think what we got to do the next time we record is. I think we have to keep this running theme of going through at least one filmmaker's filmography. Here we did okay. two. We did yeah. two great filmmakers. One made it to Mount Rushmore and one did not. But they were two great all-time filmmakers. Yeah. Next time, I'm going to let you pick the filmmakers of okay. your choice. We're going to do the same thing. You'll take the lead, so I'll let you talk more. <laughs> okay. You'll run us through the filmography. <laughs> And I'll, right. I'll, I'll be secondary commentary next time, and, and we'll see where things land with that. Um, okay. Any other final thoughts on, on film noir or people who haven't given it a chance? Like, any thoughts on, like, why they should and uh, final thoughts on what we talked about today, just to wrap things up? Well, I think film noir is just one of the great film genres of all time, Uh I love it. I love everything about it. Uh, I have heard some people say they're reluctant to watch because they feel that the movies are always going to end badly. They're going to have a sort of negative ending. And so you kind of know, oh, I know how this movie's going to end before I even start watching. But I would say, well, how is that any different from watching any other kind of movie where you know it's going to have a happy ending, right? But I also would say that not every film noir has a negative ending there are actually a few out there that have positive endings or at least okay endings so you don't really know for sure in a lot of cases but um yeah i don't know i just think there's something to those movies and uh there's really nothing like them you know so Mm -hmm. i would say anybody should give them a chance everybody should give them a chance they're just uh, one of the great film genres yeah, yeah. Um, I like the darker endings, man. <laughs> I mean, that's what attracts me to it, is that you don't know, like, if it's going to be a happy ending, you know? Some some of them do have happy endings, some of them don't. But um, I like the unpredictability of it a lot. So, mm-hmm. But uh, hopefully yeah. we, we got a few people to give these filmmakers a chance, these films a chance, and this subgenre a chance as well. Yeah, and I agree. I like the dark endings as well. I'm, I'm a fan of the, the darkness, so that isn't a problem for me. But for people who it is a problem, um, hey, some of them have happy endings, and you just never know. That sounds like a great name for the podcast. I'm a fan of the darkness. <laughs> <laughs> That's not bad. Not bad. <laughs>